Now I want to have a look at some of the more recent exam questions to see what are they doing and what are you meant to be answering and how. Okay, so let's look at this one. That's the question. And then obviously you go to the byline. So the, this is the byline. So, it's obviously not a rhetorical question in the sense that it is a yes-no answer or you mean to say sorry. Now, I felt that this particular byline was actually closer to a normal question, to be honest, because what it's doing is it's giving us alternatives. This is the first alternative, and then this is the second alternative. All right, so if it's asking us this question, it's meant to be, remember, what is the effect? So we could argue that it's introducing those two alternatives that we have as a country, and there really isn't anything else, we either participate and either we are ready to participate or we will be crushed. So I think it's, it's meant, the effect it's meant to have is quite, quite a, a shock. It's quite worrying because we might not be ready and we might be crushed. So I think it's meant to be disturbing. So look at the effect. It's a disturbing, shocking effect and introduces those two alternatives. So don't just say it's, it's, it's there to make us think because I don't think it's, it's there to make us think. Maybe there's another alternative. It's saying these are the alternatives. This is what's going to happen to the country Either this or that, nothing else. So do you see, I don't think it's meant to be creating that kind of debate in your head. But it's certainly challenging you and introducing the main idea. So I would, I would agree with that. Right, then in the advertising questions, they're asking. So there's an example. And I thought what we do here is let's have a look at the memo because... Where doing past papers is useful is you're looking to see how the examiners think. What kind of answer are they expecting? And I'm not suggesting you learn the memos. I had a student um, this week who said, all you've got to do is try to learn the memo and then twist it to fit the answer. No, I'm saying it gives you an insight into how they're expecting you to tackle it. So look at the question again. It's in an advert. And it asks that question. So what are the examiners expecting? Look at this. So it does give us the engages the reader. But notice it goes on to be specific. And here is the specificity. To identify with a common childhood experience. So it uses what, what you might say is the definition, but it takes it a step further. Then look at the second one. It encourages the reader to identify with the speaker, okay, and to do introspection or reflect over personal experiences. So it's trying to evoke memories your own memories, maybe it wasn't karate, maybe it was something else for you. So look at what the examiners want from you. It's more than a definition. So the problem is, if you just give the examiner a definition, it wants to engage the reader, it wants to make you think about the question, what does the marker give it? If it's this vague, the marker could just do that and give you naught. 
If it's out of two marks, which usually that, that uh, sort of opening question is, then the mark is saying, oh, well, what do I do with it? Well, the candidate kind of knows what the rhetorical question is. All right, I'll give it one. But you don't want one. You want two out of two. So I'm looking at how. How do I get my second mark? It engages the reader from the outset to identify. Hang on, I want a red pen. You know me, the marker. To identify with a common childhood experience. There's my two marks. Or to identify with the speaker. I want to know in what way. So second thing, to reflect over personal experiences. Okay, there's the second mark. Otherwise, to identify with the speaker who's had this common childhood experience. It would take us back to that. If you just gave me identify with the speaker, I don't see the second mark. So your job as a candidate is to make sure the marker sees where the marks are coming from. Give them something to work with. And that doesn't mean write 120 words for two marks, which my students do because they're so terrified they haven't got the marks that they write and write and write and write. Just give them some substance. Right. Ah, let me see if I can go down. Right, so this is text A in this paper. On the 14th of October 2012, please notice when we read this, we say on the 14th of October 2012, but we write a date like that. More than 8 million viewers watched one event across the world marking the biggest televised event to date. It wasn't a presidential election, a royal wedding, or an Olympic ceremony, but the mere sight of extreme daredevil Felix Baumgartner risking his life by jumping from 40 kilometers above the earth. Why such a bizarre event attracted millions of us is questionable. Why do dangerous activities like extreme sports excite us? What motivates us to participate in them? Why do we want the thrill? There are thousands of explanations for why we enjoy extreme sports. Going back to our innate needs and desires, however, the following arguably some strong explanations of our attraction to risk. And then you've got this little asterisk over there, an explanation of a daredevil. You know me, I love the Collins Dictionary Online. It gives you the definition and then it uses it for you in a sentence. So I gave you that. So what are we looking at? We're looking at those questions. Why such a bizarre event attracted millions of us is questionable. So introduce the idea of questionable and then asks, why do dangerous activities like extreme sports excite us? What motivates us to participate in them? Why do we want the thrill? So the question then is, why does the writer use those rhetorical questions? Or what is the effect of the rhetorical questions? Or what is the intention of the writer in using those rhetorical questions? Let's look at the whole context. We've got the, it's questionable here. And then the questions follow. And then we have going back to our innate needs and desires. Sorry, there are thousands of explanations for why we enjoy extreme sports. So the questions are between the idea that we need to ask questions about why people would want to see somebody risking his life to the fact that there are thousands of answers. So what are the questions doing here? They are suggesting that there are reasons that dangerous activities excite us. So here is our first answer. Excitement. We want excitement. And we get excitement from danger. Then what motiv motivates us to participate in them? So we asked about the motivation. And then again we get an answer. Thrill, which is excitement. 
Now, I feel that these questions, again, aren't the traditional rhetorical questions. The very fact that the writer goes on to say, but there are thousands of answers, tells me, look at it, there are thousands of explanations, tells me that actually these are genuine questions. They are real questions. They are not loaded questions. So you need to say that these questions are to create the effect of introducing the fact that there are going to be thousands of explanations. So the writers use these questions in order to answer immediately that there are thousands of answers. And then this bit, going back to our innate needs and desires, are arguably some of the strong explanations. So the questions are there to introduce the fact that there are lots of answers, but this writer is going to deal with one set of answers in particular. Okay, so we've looked at two things. We've looked at cartoons and we've looked at rhetorical questions. And I want to thank Liberty for the chance of doing those things. First of all, for answering the question. And then secondly, for looking at rhetorical questions which are asked regularly enough in the matric paper for you to be aware of what it is you need to do and to be more confident that you're able to do that kind of answer, answer in that kind of way that the examiners are looking for.